Okay, thank you, Martin. So as we have heard from the speakers before us, we are seeing increasing observations of abrupt changes in many ecosystems, be they freshwater, be they terrestrial, uh, and marine systems. So you've had this slide to look at for a while, so I will not dwell on it. When I'm talking about abrupt change, or we say ACEs lately in, in uh, parlance, common parlance, I mean big changes that are fast in time. They can be step functions, but they can also take a variety of different forms. They often surprise us because we often don't anticipate that they're coming. And I'd say this, this is a major challenge in contemporary ecology, but especially as we th think about the effects of climate change. So I think one of our big challenges is figuring out where, when, and why ACEs are most likely to occur. And I would also suggest that theory has outpaced our ability to apply some of these ideas in real world ecosystems and landscapes that incorporate what we understand about the ecology of them. And understanding such changes or diagnosing them, why they happen, when are they going to, what's the projection, is hard. Because it is hard to detect thresholds before you pass them. So Tim has talked about the early warning signals, but nonetheless, it's still a really hard practical challenge. Feedbacks, spatial variation, they can dampen, they can amplify, sometimes they can synchronize ecosystem responses or changes. And of course, our ecosystems are not responding to one thing at a time. It's multiple drivers that are interacting with each other and interacting with disturbances. So the second thing I'm going to emphasize is this interaction between disturbances and other drivers. So disturbance, if we think about disturbance, recovery, and abrupt change, in the upper right, uh, left for you is the green diagram showing that many ecosystems are well adapted to their natural disturbance regime. Many of them have experienced it throughout the Holocene. Um, disturbances on the, figure out, yeah, there we go. If these are events on the bottom, they happen, the system is disturbed, it recovers, and it knows how to do this usually without intervention. However, increases in the frequency of disturbance such that they reoccur before the system has had a chance to recover can cause an abrupt change. An increase in the intensity of the disturbance such that we lose some of the ecological memory or legacy can cause an abrupt change. And of course, in the bottom right, we can have the disturbances interacting with a gradual change such as the change that we're seeing in climate or the changes in variability of climate. And those can also lead to an abrupt change. Now, this is not just hypothetical in the news, um, both in the United States, but also globally. We are already seeing that the frequency, the intensity, and the size of natural disturbance events are changing, and climate is implicated within this, whether it's the changing fire regimes, the occurrence of fire in places that's, that, that is, to which it's not adapted, uh, floods and uh, hurricanes that need another category, fires that need another category of intensity. I'll give you just one example of thinking through some of these kinds of changes and what they might mean. Uh, this is from where I work in Yellowstone, where climate warming is changing the fire regime already and altering the context within which the system recovers. So the mature forests typically burn every 100 to 300 years, work by Kathy Whitlock over the paleo has documented this over the record of uh, the Holocene. Big fires, even like the big Yellowstone fires of 1988, system's well adapted, it has a standard placing fire regime, it recovers with young dense forests, no problem, it's, it's used to dealing with this. However, fires are starting to recur now at less than 30 year return intervals. We've seen that in the past few years, it is producing areas that include such high burn severity that there's very little legacy left in that system. So what does that mean for the future of the forests in that area or the Northern Rockies? I think we need to understand the mechanisms that are underpinning these changes if we want to be able to understand them in the future. The changes in the disturbance change that legacy. They change the availability of the seed, whether it's still there after the disturbance, whether the patches are so large that the seeds can't get there to recover the forests. And then we're changing the climate, so the conditions for uh, regrowing and establishing the trees are also changing. So I think we need to think about our science in a time of constant change, recognizing that ecosystems may have breakpoints. I mean, we've seen examples of this at the global scale and also at a variety already. We should expect more ACEs as the climate change continues, knowing where, when, and why especially is important, recognizing the contingencies, context matters, sequence matters, legacy matters. Um, understanding mechanisms is key, identifying thresholds, maybe it's soil moisture that can, controls your return, uh, whether or not your forest can recover or not. And I think we are going to have to have multiple approaches that are complementary. So long-term studies that help us detect our changes, regional studies that have the variance across the gradients that we think matter, 
experiments that get at those thresholds, the mechanisms, and the hypotheses, and uh, process-based models that allow for the novel dynamics that can't have the past empirical relationships baked in, and they've got to start including some of the, um, the mechanisms that are at the ecological scale. Thank you. I think I got the five minutes.